Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Atheist Experience Live. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Russell Glasser. Hey Matt, great we to be here. We had some uh, changes in co-hosts and shuffling around, and today's show uh, is going to be considerably different than past shows. But this is a live public access show sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. It's uh, March 27th, 2011, and we stream this live over the internet. For more information about the show, you can go to atheist-experience.com. And for more information about the ACA, you can visit www.atheist-community.org. And there you'll find a frequently asked questions page, ways to contact us via email. Uh, the email address, by the way, is tv at atheist-community.org. We cannot possibly promise to answer all of them, especially the ones we got in this week, <laughs> which was uh, quite the flood. So most of you uh, who watch regularly and are, have been in the chat channel associated with Ustream since about 10 o'clock this morning, whatever, are already aware that we have on the phone uh, Ray Comfort, uh, who many of you know, and I'll be introducing in a have couple of Have people been minutes. camping out with pup tents? I think something? so. I think they wanted to make sure that they got in on the stream, but also we, uh, on both Facebook and the blog, submitted a request for people to send in questions. Um, you know, we got, I don't know, 100 and some odd people. All told, yeah. could be close to 200. Yeah, it, it was a bunch of questions. Some were serious, some were not. Some were decent questions, some were not. Some were mean-spirited, some were not. Uh, Russell and I reviewed them. We had a bunch of stuff uh, of our own that we wanted to talk about, obviously, since this is uh, you know, the first opportunity we've, we've had to chat with Ray. And we'll get to that in just a couple minutes. For more information, uh, if you go to the ACA website, you'll find uh, also a calendar of events, which includes things like our monthly lecture series at the Austin History Center and the Atheist Happy Hour on Thursdays. Um, and after this program's over, we get together for dinner at El Arroyo um, on uh, Fifth Street. And th normally they would put the address up. We're still having issues with our CG. So the joys of live TV in a public access studio. Um, our guest today, who I'm going to go ahead and introduce real quick, is Ray Comfort, who runs Living Waters Ministries, uh, produces a television series uh, in conjunction with Kirk Cameron called The Way of the Master. Uh, he's the author of many books. And he has a blog that is frequented by uh, atheists and I suppose some Christians alike, maybe. And he's a popular street evangelist. Um, Ray, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Matt. It's great to be here. How are you? I'm uh, really, really good. I'm very excited, and I'm privileged to be on this program. Thank you so much. Sure, I appreciate you calling it, or us actually calling you, whatever. However, we managed to get you on here. There was some confusion as to whether we'd even be able to call out, but uh, toll-free numbers are allowed, so yeah, it works thanks fine. for coming on. It's great to have you. Thanks oh. for thanks for having a toll-free number. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you too, Russell. So, um, uh, you had asked for uh, for us to to pull some questions, and we did, and of course we had some of our own, um, but I wanted to get, get kind of started here. Um, obviously, we have different perspectives about reality. The, you have uh, within your worldview, or maybe coloring your entire worldview, is this idea that a God exists, particularly the God as represented in the Bible, and I do not. Now, considering that we're, we have a different view about this, what is, what is the best method to resolve that, to, to come to some agreement about what is truth? Well, I don't know if you could put your finger on what is truth. I can, as a Christian, I can say I found absolute truth. Um, Jesus said, I am the truth. And I don't know if any atheist can point to some atheist that said that or point to anything that you can say this is absolute reality. For you, the whole thing could be an illusion. So, so say, I could do that right now, but you wouldn't believe me. Okay, yeah. give, me a, <laughs> give me a try. <laughs> okay, uh, I am the way. Everything I say is true. Yeah, okay. So, so now, now, now resurrect yourself from the dead and I'll believe you. Well, how do you know that that happened? Well, the thing is, for, for a Christian, um, we, we're not going by a belief. We're going by the power of God, 
before I was a Christian, I believed in Jesus. I believed that he was an historical figure. But on the night of my conversion, I came to know him, whom the Bible says to know his life eternal. So uh, just as far more real than I know my wife is my, my, my walk with Christ. It's, uh, it's my very life itself. So when Jesus said, I am the life, he means he is the very source of life. He's the substance of life that became a human being for the specific purpose of destroying death for humanity. Sure. So, but to, from an external point of view, we're still dealing with a claim. You, you are making an appeal to some experience that you've had, um, which testifies to the reality of it for you. And what I'm asking is, absent that experience, how could anybody else possibly know? Could, could well, they be justified? Well, that's a good question. It's like if you didn't believe in electricity because you can't see it, hear it, touch it, taste or smell it. Believe and in I what? Said, Sorry? If you didn't believe in electricity. Oh. Because it's an invisible force. And I said, yeah, hey, take this fork, stick up this light socket, and you'll more than believe your experience is power. And that's what happens when someone truly becomes a Christian. They move out of the realm of intellect into the realm of personal experience. They don't just believe. They know experientially about the power of God. And that's the power that God puts behind the gospel. Now, wait a minute. I want to back up a minute because you said that uh, it would move out of the realm of intellect. But the, that makes it not a good al analogy to electricity like you just said, right? Because the realm of intellect is exactly how we know all the details of how electricity works. Yeah, but you don't experience it. There's a difference between an intellectual acknowledgement you know, electricity is real, and actually feeling its power through your body. Right. So you're still appealing to the, the, the primary, I guess, uh, the primary proof, for lack of a better word, is direct experience. And I, I'm just asking, are you then conceding that absent that direct experience, people wouldn't be justified in believing no, no, um, not when it comes to the existence of God. All you need is eyes that can see it, a brain that works. You yeah. look at creation and say there's a creator. But what atheists do, or should I say the new atheists or contemporary atheists, they say there's no creation. That denotes a creator. And right, that, that, because... That, that denotes yeah. a moral responsibility. So we just call it nature. And sure. nature created itself, which is unreasonable makes no sense. Something cannot create itself. Yes, that, that statement is nonsensical. Nature created itself. You're, right. There's a number of errors in grammar there. You can't just call something creation in order to say, I'm going to call this creation, therefore it had to have a creator. Obviously, if it's a creation, it had to have a creator. Right. But it's not necessarily creation. You haven't demonstrated that. You've just simply asserted that it's a creation. And the, 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 the thing that you're objecting to about saying nature created itself, that's more of a grammatical problem because nobody, the, the, the idea isn't that nature created itself as some kind of thoughtful act. It's that the that existence doesn't necessarily require the creator that you claim it does well you tell me what was in the beginning without saying i don't know well why can't i say i don't know <laughs> because that's ignorance and you can't have that as an atheist well, yes you can because atheists aren't asserting absolute certainty or knowledge that or any any of that stuff well christians do because they know that there's a creation and there's a creator sure. and so, so but asserting assert that asserting knowledge is different from demonstrating that this knowledge is true well you see i don't need to demonstrate to a reasonable person that a painting had a painter right do you know why tell me why because we recognize um we recognize that a painting had a, pa had a painter, not because it's complex, not because it's ordered. We recognize this from experience. All evidence points to this thing uh, having uh, or being designed. Okay, we, we recognize design by contrasting it with what is naturally occurring. And that's why you can hold up a painting and a tree side by side, and you would say, oh, this is, the painting is obviously the creation of an intelligent mind because we have no examples of paintings coming into existence on their own we have no examples of, of paintings being able to reproduce all evidence we have millions of examples of paintings created by thinking minds so all of the evidence points to this the contrast though is that trees do naturally re reproduce as do people and living things we have a good understanding of how planets form out of accretion disks from from suns those things are naturally occurring that contrast between naturally occurring and created is something that is how we determine whether or not 
something was designed. And what you're doing is kind of like, you're familiar obviously with, with uh, Haley's watchmaker analogy where you find a watch and its intricate workings supposedly lead one to do, deduce that it was designed. Um, but in reality, what you, what you have is a watch lying on a field of watches in a universe of watches because you believe everything is designed. So there is no point of contrast for you. What you believe, if I'm getting it rightly, is that you believe everything has a semblance of design. From the atom through the universe, it seems to be designed. There's order. There's not chaos. No, I wouldn't say it seems to be designed, I'd, I'd, because I was specifically saying that design is contrasted against naturally occurring. Order itself is not necessarily a product of design. Um, sand, sand dunes in the desert look very orderly, but they're not designed, and they, they don't give not everything gives the impression of design, and those things which do give the impression of design aren't necessarily designed. People have, uh, you know, for a very long time, described things as appearing to be designed because the way people learn in general is to make analogies to things that they already know. So when we say how the eye works, we, we tend to describe it in terms of things that we know how they already work, like, uh, like a camera. But that doesn't mean that the eye is a literal camera. I right. agree with that. Oh, of course. But he, here's my contention. Mm -hmm. is that everywhere you look in this universe, we see design or order. No, we don't. Well, you don't, but I do. Yeah, and okay? that's and why. That comes and that's let, 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 him let him yeah. finish. Let me, let me finish. So our most intelligent person on the face of, face of this earth cannot create a grain of sand from nothing. We can't create a leaf, a flower, a bird, let alone an eye or a brain. So to say that all this nature, as you want to call it, that came to being without a creative designer is to be disingenuous because it cannot make itself. It's crazy to think that. First of all, there's a huge fallacy there of saying that the smartest person can't make a grain of sand. Um, it, it, I, I, I can't even begin to identify how much is actually wrong with it, that statement. Um, but you're, you're characterizing this as a creation from nothing still. And this all coming to being on its own. If we look at the universe, the, the limited understanding that we have so far, which is growing constantly, the best method that we have for understanding reality has been the scientific method, by and large. Um, it's the single most reliable, consistent, uh, self-correcting method for discerning truth. Now, if there's some other way of finding out the truth about reality, of course, we'd all be interested in, in knowing it. But when you say that the smartest person on the earth can't create a grain of sand, therefore, it must have been created by some other... I, didn't, I actually didn't say that, Matt. Well, you said um, it, would, it would be absurd no, to think that this me, came me, into its let own. Let me tell you what I said sure. so you can back up a little. The smartest person, most intelligent person on the face of this earth cannot create a grain of sand from nothing. All right. We can recreate what sure. God's already given us. We can change it. Well, we can we can modify. We can modify what what's already there. Right. But but you are still just asserting that we are modifying things that God gave us. And yeah. I'm I'm saying, apart from your appeal to some special way of knowing, this direct revelation from God or direct experience with with God, how else could we justify that? Because that could never. Yeah, surely you would agree that your personal experience could not possibly be justification for somebody else. Yeah, but let's go back to what we're talking about. Do you agree or don't you agree with me when I say the most intelligent person on the face of this earth cannot create a grain of sand, a leaf, a flower, or a bird, or a frog from nothing? We don't know where to start. I, I agree. agree with that. And, and I, I also say that 50,000 years ago, the most intelligent person on the face of the earth probably couldn't have uh, created a cell phone from the actual pieces. Yeah. Well, I don't know how that's yeah. relevant. And the other thing, too, you mentioned the scientific method. Could you define that for me? Well, there's a number of different definitions, and you, and, but the, the guiding principle is that you begin with an observation, you develop a hypothesis, and then there is a process of testing and falsification, peer-reviewed research where others attempt to replicate your results and to falsify them to demonstrate you know, that from, we're, we're constantly trying to prove that this is wrong. Um, and then you get to the point where a, an hypothesis has graduated and becomes a theory, and it becomes the best current explanation possible. Um, 
I noticed, you know, there's been a lot of times where you've talked about the origin of the earth or evolution um, and any number of things where people who understand the subjects much better than I do and uh, much, but probably better than any in this room do um, have corrected you on things and yet the arguments keep, or your arguments remain the same. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to why that is. I mean, if, if for example, in your book, um, you can lead an atheist to evidence, but you can't make him think, uh, you answered a question in, from an email that was, how old do you think the Earth is? And you essentially said you had no idea how old the Earth is, but science doesn't either. And, or science has continually changed because, you know, years ago they thought it was 100 million years, and now they're up to 4.5 billion years. Right. Well, science hasn't made any steps towards the absurd notion that it's six to 10,000 years old. And at each stage, the date was the best available. We are building on knowledge as we, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, seeing further all the time. And so the idea that science hasn't any idea uh, or any good idea about how old the earth is, is just demonstrably wrong. Could it change over the next 100 years? Will the date become more precise over the next hundred years? Yes. Qu quite possibly, if we get additional information. So that means, at the present day, a modern dating could be wrong, more than likely. Yes. So, However, we therefore, what, science doesn't know how old the Earth is. Well, it, it, you're, it could be wrong. you're still you're still referring to no as an as an assertion of absolute certainty, and science doesn't do that, and no rational person should, uh, outside of a handful of of. Uh, of things that we can be absolutely certain about, you know, the, you know, the, our own existence and direct experience things. You're you're saying that science doesn't know just because it hasn't come up with a firm date that the Earth is. That's right. 4. It could change 2. by a billion years in the next hundred years easily. Yeah, but, but it's not going to go down to six to ten thousand years. I mean, that's incredibly unlikely. But I didn't say that. I, I understand, but yeah. what you're presenting is that as long as you can't be absolutely certain about something. Every answer is just as good as any other. That it, that if science isn't absolutely certain to the minute or second about how old the Earth is, that a, a, an answer of four to six thousand years, six to ten thousand years, is equally viable as one that's four and a half billion years, and that's just simply not true. No, I didn't say that, and I didn't say if science can't. Be I know you didn't say it. That's the, the implication. I was to the second or the minute. I'm saying you guys change by the billions. Um. When you talk about error bars, I mean, uh, changing things, it doesn't change by the billions. It, what are you went, talking about? Well, you just <laughs> check, check out the last hundred years, the history of how old science thought the Earth is, and you'll right. find it just, it just jumps all over the place, you know, from hundreds of thousands to millions to billions. Sure. But and do, so, so I don't right. like that. I like something being a little more precise, well, and when it's more precise, uh, I'll say, okay. But, that's Ray, let me, I, I'm let me sorry. go back. Hang on. Okay. I'm sorry that you don't like that, but that's what happens when you learn more. When you learn something new, you change according with the evidence. The preponderance of evidence is such that it changes minds. Well, Matt, Matt, what would you, what would you think if I just kept changing all the time to a point where I was unreasonable, where I'd change terminologies? Well, um, what do you mean? I'm not quite sure what you mean well, by change. Well, this is the question I, I have with atheists saying there's no such thing as creation when everyone knows there's a creation. That, no, we don't. No, and we the don't. fact that you keep asserting everyone knows it when I'm sitting here as someone who does not know it okay, makes you demonstrably you wrong. There's a creation out there. I know there's a creation. It's always Look, been called Ray, a creation. Ray, I'd yeah. like to ask you a question about your grain of sand analogy. Yeah. Have you ever personally seen any intelligent being whatsoever create a grain of sand? I don't have to. I can see this creation out there to show okay. me there's a creation. So, on the one hand, you're asking atheists to account for every detail, every bit of information, to the precise second, to the precise millimeter of whatever it is they're measuring. But on the other hand, uh, what you want us to accept in return is that the thing you say, because you are willing to come on here and say, I know what it is, I have absolute knowledge, I have certainty, that we should believe you when here you are saying, uh, I've never observed that sort of thing either, but it just happens. Russell, what I'm saying is that apply the scientific method to that which is around you. Observe what's been made and you'll come up, there's a makeup. How can I assign the scientific method when there's no observations, there's no tests, there's no kind of measurement that you can even propose that would tell the difference between a universe with a God and one without one? Yes, there is. What's the test? Okay. Common sense. 
Um, is that really the, what you think the scientific method is? That's what all you need to, to have is common sense and say, look at this beautiful creation with its flowers and birds. And so seasons. when you say that your belief in God is consistent with, the, uh, with science, do you say that? Of course, science just means okay. knowledge. But what, you, but what you mean by that is just think about it and apply common sense and go with the first thing that you believe and that's right. Is that no, where no, you're going? No, not at all. Now let me repeat it. If you look around, you'll see flowers, birds, seasons, fruits, uh, all these beautiful things in creation that surround us uh -huh. that tell us or tell a reasonable mind that an intelligent designer made it because we, with our intelligence, can't create even one grain of sand from nothing. So, so, so anybody who doesn't see this design has an unreasonable mind? Yeah, exactly right. Okay. Or, as, or they're not sane. As, as a possibly insane and unreasonable uh, person, um, do you go to the doctor? All the time. Um, do you realize how much medical science has changed in the last hundred years or so? Absolutely, and it's Do, still changing, and hospitals are still very dangerous places. And, and yet you still rely on that as the best possible information about medical health, right? Yes. So why is it that you will take that, that scientific assessment when it comes to something like health, but you don't take it with regard to biology and other things? Because I don't need to. My health isn't dependent on what I believe about the theory of evolution. Um, actually, it kind of is okay, because the, the, the theory of evolution is how we use, uh, how we develop vaccines and other medicines that kill things that evolve, living things, viruses, bacteria, etc. Okay. So the theory I of evolution. It, I took a flu shot. You got me. Okay. <laughs> but, but my question, though, was how is it that you can justify accepting medicine as the best explanation for what our understanding of health and taking it you and, do, yet, in fact, and yet yeah. refuse to do the same when the same science based on the exact same principles done by some of the same people come up with answers that disagree with your preconception about well, no no i don't have a preconception about the earth it's just that we're talking about when you talk about science you're talking about the age of the earth is that i don't i'm really not talking about the age of the earth i'm talking about evolution the age of the earth all of it all of these things are science based solutions and you're accepting you're cherry picking what science you want to accept no no i i actually don't I don't think the theory of evolution is even slightly scientific. I think it's bogus. I think it's a fruit tale for grown-ups. Okay. I used to, to believe to it, man. I used to believe it, but I no longer believe it because I don't like having to use blind faith when it comes to something like that. But you do, <laughs> but you do oh, agree, sorry. you would agree with the statement, wouldn't you, that although it's a fairy tale for grown-ups, uh, it's something that the vast majority of practicing credentialed, like, PhD biologists would say is true. I mean, we, I'm not saying for you to say uh, evolution is true. You just agree that that puts you at odds with the vast majority of the scientists community. Am I right? It, it doesn't worry me. I'll stay with, uh, with Newton and a few other folks like that that believe that God created the universe. Sure, okay, so sure. So you're bothered by the fact centuries that Centuries and centuries changes. ago, when they didn't have the, the newer information, um, you're, you're, you're wanting to stay in the dark ages, is what you're saying. No, I'm not. I you, just don't want to have to accept something by faith, and you believe the but, theory of evolution. But you I don't, don't have it. to. You don't. I don't accept anything on faith, and I don't take the, the theory of evolution on faith. It's completely supported by evidence, right down to DNA. I mean, and, and you take Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, and an evangelical Christian, although you, you may disagree, um, has, has said that even if there were no transitional fossils, which in fact there are, and if there were no other evidence, the DNA evidence alone is enough to confirm common ancestry. But the fact that people use the genetic aspect of evolution in the lab to not only develop vaccines and medications, but also speciation has been observed in the lab as well. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how anybody can possibly say that this is something that needs to be accepted on faith. Okay, uh, let me just take you back on that. You said transitional fo fossils, there are plenty. Sure. Sure, there are plenty. I would like to know, are there any species to species transitional fossils? Everything is in constant state of transition. No, 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 no. no. I, mean, I, don't mean, I don't mean that. Yeah. Don't spread it out that far. Just give me a specific... It's, well, Ray, I've, you, you, you have a fundamental misunderstanding about evolution, I guess. Straighten me out. That, that you, you, I think what you're looking for is a, uh, a cat-to-dog. No, no. What are, you, what are you looking for? I'm looking for something that shows 
something that shows a change, evolution from one kind to another. What's a kind? Well, because kind has no scientific definition. Well, if I say species, you'll say what species? Because it's got well, no, no actually, because I'll happily give you. Um, Eoraptor, Herosaurus, Allosaurus, Archaeopteryx, um, Tiktaalik, uh, Homo erectus, me sitting here right now, we are all transitional forms. You have to think about things on the evolutionary time scale. Yeah. Ray, you do understand what a species is, right? I mean, what, what the scientific definition of it is. No, because there are about 16 or 17 you, different biological definitions okay, for the you, word species. Do you know what the main one is? Because, I mean, a lot of people, we mentioned uh, we had solicited questions, and by far uh, the most frequent question was to have you explain your current understanding of evolution. Because... I, um, a lot of very smart people have in the past tried to explain this sort of stuff to you and uh, and it just seems to flow right off. So, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, well, I hate to put it that way, but I, I there, wanna, there I, is like a primary definition of a species as it's used by biologists. Do you I, know I want to give, give that to me, William Matt, and then we'll just we see if we're agreeing on it. But awesome. it's like you cannot yeah. pin it down, the word species. It's got so many definitions. A species, okay, two populations make up separate species if they can't interbreed with each other. Okay. Okay? Under that definition, lots of transitional species, I mean, lots of changes from one species to, the lab, uh, to another have occurred under laboratory con conditions. I can provide you a reference if you want it. You're talking about bacteria? Um, not just bacteria. I'm talking it's about like uh, flies. Uh, ver I what mean, uh, flies? in order for specific? in order for things to uh, occur under laboratory conditions, obviously they have to have a short enough lifespan that they can change in an observable time. Okay, frame. when you say change, do they change to another species? species. Yes. Yeah. So another in species other words, of fly, they isolate two populations. An another species they of fly, two populations. the change is always going to be gradual. Right. It's they like put the two species back together and they can't interbreed with each other. That okay, happens. So you have two flies that can't interbreed or you have two lots of bacteria that can't interbreed. Right. Correct. And that's your proof of Darwinian evolution. It is a, the no, man, no, 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 it's man not. It's an, an example. Ancestor. And it, it's not the proof. And, and it, not only that, it is, guys, it got, is Ray. Got, it is not the proof. It is one piece of evidence. I got to tell you, this is probably the strongest evidence because the one I keep, it's the one you guys keep coming back to. Bacteria that can't interact with bacteria. We've it's mentioned it exactly I mean, once. I've got to finish my thought. You've got to let me I, finish my thought. I, I, just, I just don't like you misrepresenting it. You say you guys keep coming back to it. You brought up the word bacteria, I think and Russell provide one example. I mean, go ahead. I think by you guys, he meant atheist in general. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, and, and okay. that's the best you've got. And it's... No. It's from, well, it's, when I say you, I mean, that's what I keep hearing from atheists. Every time I say be specific, but you've got to receive that by faith. You didn't observe it. You've got to receive what some other person has told you. No, 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 no. First of all, that, okay, maybe we have different definitions of, of faith. Um, because, you know, if, if Russell tells me that he observed something, I'm not, I don't necessarily believe it absolutely just because Russell told me. Do you trust him? I, I generally do trust him. That's yes. faith. That's not faith because... And not, not at least in the, in the way that I look at faith. Um, I'm trusting Russell based on a measure of reasonable, I, I don't trust him completely, I trust him to the degree that is earned based on the actual evidence. If I know Russell to be a generally truthful person, I will believe him to, the extent, to a certain extent. I mean, if he tells me he was abducted by aliens, I don't care how much I like the guy and how Actually, trustworthy he is, I'm going to need more evidence than merely his word. But if he says he got a new pet dog, I know that dog people have pets and pet dogs. Not all claims are created equal, and you assess a claim based on its merits. But I want to, let me see if I can find another way to kind of expose this evolution issue with you. Um, we know, to the extent that we can know anything, that, uh, for example, Spanish and Italian are both derivatives of Latin, correct? I suppose so. I trust you. Well, okay. That'll be your undoing. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, we, have, we, we, have, we are able to trace back um, the origins of these languages. We categorize them. We understand that these came out of, of uh, Latin. And you can see a difference even amongst 
different English languages, but Spanish and Italian are different, and they both derive from Latin. Find me the, there is no mother who gave, a Latin speaking mother who gave birth to a Spanish speaking child. Some people continued to speak Latin. Some people moved off and their Latin changed and became Spanish over time. Some people moved off and their Latin became Italian over time. And at no point was there this, uh, the crocoduck of language, the Latin, the Latin Spanaduck or whatever. Spanish people Italian. gave birth to kids that spoke the language within their region. And over a great deal of time and a separation regionally, they became different distinct languages. That is directly analogous to what happens with species under evolution. Okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, I wasn't expecting an okay. <laughs> no, I've got to say it's okay. It's what you guys believe, and you just hang with that if you so wish. I don't believe it. I, I know you don't, but do you also you don't believe, believe that believe Spanish it? and Italian have a common You've already told us why you don't believe it. Well, why don't I believe you it? You said that you don't believe it because you don't like to take things on faith. And I, t I said that this isn't something we're taking on faith. This is something that there is a massive amounts of evidence for. I mean, have you bothered to... It's I'm, evidence that you believe. Yes, uh, okay, of course Okay, I don't believe that evidence. Right. Okay? This and is why, what I believe. Why, why don't you believe that evidence? Is because what of this. I know God. I've known God since 1972, 21st of April, 1.30 sure. in the morning. His word tells me that he created man in his own image, with a, with a moral responsibility, that's what separates man from the animals. We, we have a moral understanding. And he made man with the ability to recreate after his own kind, and he made them male and female. Evolution, the theory of evolution, doesn't give me any of that information. You don't know where we came from. I've never had any evolutionist explain to me why male and female are in everything but slugs Actually, and you worms. have. I've got uh, records right, of finish. where they explained it. Let me yeah. finish. Let me finish. I haven't had evolutionists explain to me why we have in 1.4 million different kinds on this earth, except for slugs and worms, why there's male and female. We keep coming back to this population thing. I, I ask, how, how come, how, were we all once fish? And evolutionists say, yeah, we were. And they explain to me that fish came up in groups to, to develop lungs or evolve lungs while on the land. They developed the lungs under the water. And I just Excellent. can't believe that. I don't have that sort of faith. I, I, I understand. And what you've just said is, is something that I brought up earlier that you denied. You don't believe the evidence. You don't accept the evidence because you have a presupposition that it's wrong. There's you, no evidence. You, you, oh, now there's no evidence. There's just there's changes in bacteria and flies that can't interbreed with each other. No, I mean, we're talking about transitional fossils and dinosaurs and all kinds of things. But you said that you didn't have a presupposition, and now you're saying you don't believe the evidence, and now you're saying there is no evidence, because you already believe what the Bible says about origin. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's called a presupposition. And if, are you infallible? God is. Okay, are but you? are you? Of course not. Could you be wrong about God? I could be wrong about God, but God's not wrong. Okay, if you could be wrong about God and you are necessarily contingent on your own personal experience, how do you know you're right? Because for 22 years I was wrong. I had to admit my wrong and say God is right. He is justified. I can trust him. And then I came to know him. See, but and Ray, for, how do you know for that? almost for 28 years, I was wrong. I believed something sincerely. And then I realized that what I believed was not in accordance with the evidence and with reason. And despite sincere, honest appeals to God to reveal himself to me, to demonstrate, to help me through, um, to do what it was that he willed, the, no answers came, and so I don't have whatever experience it is that you have. But when you look at the evidence that's presented to you, and first say you don't believe it, and then say there is no evidence, and then state that it's because you already accept this other thing, that's a presupposition, and that's what I was trying to get at a while ago. Matt, did you know the Lord? Uh, did, I, did I think I knew the Lord? No, sure. did, you, did you know the Lord? Well, clearly I didn't, and I don't think anybody else does either. No, you can't say that. you just got to say you didn't. No, you I, I can say I do not think anyone else does That's either. That's right. But I, you don't know what everybody else I knows. I have not asserted absolute certainty or knowledge on any point in discussion, and yet you keep coming back to it. Did I think that I was a true Christian, that I knew the Lord? Absolutely. Do I think that I actually did? Of course not. If I thought that, I would still believe. So let's, let's just, just touch on this for a minute. So you didn't know the Lord? No. So you were never a Christian? I agree, under your definition. Under of the biblical definition, not uh, mine. Okay, 
under the definition of Christianity that you use, which you claim is consistent with the Bible, whatever, however you want to do it, under that understanding where somebody actually truly knew God, of course I wasn't a Christian. That's right. Because there's no way that I could possibly have known a God and had it be actually true, something actually occurred, and then not believe it later. Right. That's but right. see, Ray, because I'm a poor, benighted atheist myself, when you say that I know the Lord and I have had a relationship with the Lord for, for X many years, I don't believe you. And uh, so under that definition, you're not a Christian either. That's right. Uh, and so we're two guys, we're, we're three guys on TV with competing, disagreeing opinions, and it's the outside viewer that we're wondering about, and the question is, how are they, the undecided, going to figure out uh, which one of us to believe? I that's mean, a, I mean you really just keep saying question. over and over again, I know the Lord. That's a really good question. All they have to do is obey the gospel. They've just got to take a minute to look at maybe the Beatitudes where Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery with her in your heart, Examine yourself under the light of those commandments and say, if there's a judgment day, what's going to happen to me? And then come to the cross and have your sins forgiven and you'll come to know God the moment you repent and trust in the Savior. And you'll say, well, God is knowable. And suddenly the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened and everything will look different. Yeah. You'll realize you were once like a blind man who couldn't see. Except that I agree with all of that when I was a believer and was convinced that it had happened to me. That's when you didn't know the Lord. I, 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 I've already conceded that point, right? I'm saying that I was convinced same as you. exactly as you had the same opinion. No, 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 you didn't know the Lord. You weren't I, exactly like me. I was convinced and... And you were uh, deceived. Uh, All those years, 28 years, you were deceived. Sure. Now, how is it, how is it that you have this idea that this is all somebody has to do uh, to be a true Christian and know God, and yet despite being raised in a good Christian home, um, despite going to church, despite sincerely uh, seeking God, despite sincerely giving my life to Christ, rededicating on occasion, and seeking out to become a minister, in all sincerity, was I just, why did I not get this? Probably because of this. You never had a genuine knowledge of sin. You never looked at the spiritual light of the commandments and saw that God sees your thought life, and he's so holy... He sees lust as adultery, hatred as murder, nothing I, is hid from his eyes. So I Ray, absolutely understood that. Okay, did you truly repent? Of, on, yes, on several occasions. As a matter of fact, um, I first well, walked... Well, you just need it once. Well, I, I know, but here's the thing. Um, when you go down the aisle at five years old at a revival, and then in your teen years, when you're actually, after you've been in church for a number of years, and you come to understand things better, you know the Lord better, um, you realize that, hey, maybe, maybe when I was five... I couldn't have understood this enough to actually do it. Exactly so, right, Matt. So you do it again, and Matt, again, you, you were the product of the, again. Of, of the of modern evangelism, which I abhor. The use of music and older calls and, and personal manipulation of your hearers, sure. I hate that. And it produces false conversions, and a lot of people that end up, as the Bible says, the latter end becomes worse than the first. Sure, how do we tell so, between a false conversion and a true conversion? Yeah, actually, Matt and I have, have been to a lot, of, a, a lot of churches together here in Texas, uh, and we've seen a lot of people who currently believe that they are true Christians, who yeah. think that they have been saved. Uh, but... Uh, uh, for a lot of them, you would say that they're actually deceived right now, that they're not saved. Am I right? Yeah, the, you, the Bible says there are false, ver false conversions, okay. tears among the wheat. How do we that, know you're not one of them? Well, you don't know, and that's why you've got to check me out according to the Scripture. Am I speaking the truth or am I lying? There's plenty of false prophets and fake pastors out there and people in the pews that aren't genuinely converted. There's a lot of hypocrisy. And I find that's what offends people like Richard Dawkins and like yourself. You hate hypocrisy, you hate religious hypocrisy, and so do I. I don't want to see uh, people d saying things they don't believe and doing things they know they should or so, shouldn't do. So can you tell whether or not somebody's a true Christian? No, of course not. Okay, but you can, you, I, you I can, agree. Yeah, okay. let me finish the sentence. <clears throat> sure. But Jesus said, by their fruits you should know them. And if someone is loving and kind... You can, you can conclude, you know, you can say Hitler wasn't a Christian, though he, he thought he was, okay? Where a lot of atheists say Hitler was a Christian because he said, I'm a Christian. No, no. If you slaughter other people, if you kill them in mass, you can know someone's not a Christian because a Christian will love his enemies and do good to those that spitefully use them. So you look for fruit in, in their life. And, uh, and people that are hateful aren't Christians, and people that steal and lie and commit adultery um, aren't bringing forth fruit that so, should be in so the life no of a Christian. So no Christian can do a bad thing. Well, no Christian should deliberately should. I, play a hypocrite. Can't. 
You said if you look around and you see them doing these things, you know they're not a true Christian. Well, no, they're not fruits that should, have, should be evident in a true Christian. Well, I mean, well, Barry, what I'd like to know is, have you ever told a lie? You know, I've, told, I've told lots of lies in my life. I've sinned many, many times, and yes. that's why I need a Savior. But, okay, so by our fruits, we should know that you're not a true Christian. No, Isn't that right? The, the, that's not a valid question. Okay. The, quite, because he could have lied many times before actually coming to know Jesus, and then he never lied again. That's right. Have you lied since then? Not knowingly. And so you, you okay. Have you looked at a woman with lust in your heart? Yeah, but not deliberately. I, you know, obviously my eyes have wandered onto a billboard poster. I thought, oh, I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I say, God, please forgive me. And it happens all the time. A Christian doesn't dive into sin. He falls into sin. A hypocrite dives in. Sure. Well, then so it seems like by your fruits you can't know them. I, I mean, you know, Hitler is just a more extreme case of that, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. And if you read the scriptures, it says don't go around judging people as Christians. Um, on the day of judgment, you'll find the genuine from the false. Sure. So... You know, so, if you can't know, then maybe I'm the only true Christian. Well, make sure you're, you're right with God yourself. That's what the Bible says. Every man will give an account of himself to I, God. I, I, I am well versed in what the Bible actually has to say. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that we would come to agreement on an, a number of points from, of, of theology from different aspects. Right. And, you know, for example... Um, yeah, Pat Robertson every January or so goes out and gives his predictions that he supposedly got from God, and to me he looks like a TV psychic, and he, <laughs> he's, he's continually wrong. Yeah, I and, know, it's and just yet, crazy. And despite that, you were on his show, I mean... <laughs> I even go on atheist shows, so you can't pick on me for that. Yeah, but I mean, if you're, a on, a show, if you're, on, an, if you're on a show with another Christian, ta or somebody who claims to be a Christian, I mean, there there's, seems to be a little bit more of a possible kind of endorsement thing there. But um, I, I, let, let me ask you this, because... Uh, you're, you're a huge fan of using the Ten Commandments. Yes, sir. Um, it's part of your, your atheist test, um, which, you know, I, uh, we've addressed a number of times. But um, what about the rest of the Old Testament? What about, for example, uh, sanctioning slavery or God telling the Israelites to go around slaughtering people? Why is it that we, I mean, I realize they weren't Christians, they were Jews, uh, but, you know, why isn't their fruit something that, we can look at. Well, I don't agree with slavery, but you've got to realize when we say the word slavery, we look through the eyes of American cruel slavery where people no, are kidnapped. Sir. No, sir. I, well, I, I do. I, I do. When okay. I, you say to me slavery, it's got an immediate connotation of people being taken from Africa, put in chains, put in ships, and dragged <laughs> to America and sold as slaves, as, as I, human cargo. Well, I don't see that in the Bible. I see what's called really? bond servants or slaves. No, no, no. Hang, hang on. Um, I've, I've had this, this argument over and over again with people claiming the Bible doesn't sanction that kind of slavery. The I haven't finished. The Bible is very... I haven't finished. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. About there is where Israel took enemies into slavery, and they did buy and sell them in that aspect, and I don't agree with that. But it's in the Bible, and Yeah, it's, well, there's a lot of things in the Bible I don't agree with. Oh, okay. Well, in, in this case, it's something that's in the Bible that's supposedly sanctioned by God, um, where... It, I like you know, the way you said supposedly. Well, of course, everything in the Bible supposedly... I, I, you, you, why would that surprise you? Um, the, the, but the Bible, the Bible is very clear that you are you can own another person uh, as property, pass them on. You can beat your slaves as long as they don't die within a day or two. Right. So I'm not looking at this through the lens of American slavery. I'm looking at what the Bible actually has to say about the subject. And it seems to me that if there was a God who inspired the Bible, that it would be very easy. And perhaps maybe one of the Ten Commandments should have been, "Thou shalt not own another human being as property." Well, you know what we do when people get in debt over here? We throw them in the jail for like 20 years and let them rot in jail, okay? Well, what they did in scriptural times among Israel, if someone got in debt, they could become a slave or a bond servant and work off that debt right, and then be released after seven years. That's a, that's a Jew that's enslaving right. another Jew. That's right. And that's, a Jew that's, enslaving somebody who's not a Jew, that wasn't a, a servility thing, and they weren't required to let him go in seven true. years. That's true. And also, they could trick the Jews into having to be slaves forever by giving them a wife and kids. So th this is not some nicer form of slavery. I mean, I'm, fi I'm glad that you are opposed to slavery and that you are not a fan of everything that's, that's in the Bible. Absolutely. But there's, there's no reason to pretend like this is even remotely nicer than it is because it's one of the most vile, disgusting aspects of the entire book, a book that's called the good book that we give to kids. And I find that kind of repugnant. Hey, the Bible is full of very violent acts. There's women having the babies ripped out of wombs. There's yeah. people with their heads cut off. 
It doesn't hide the atrocities of man. It reveals them and says God is going to judge the world in righteousness. Well, and in some cases, but, God is commanding them. Right. Yeah, but so, so you believe this, this really happened? No, but so what, what I'm... What are you getting upset about? I'm upset because there are people who believe it really happened. Be and, and, and because people are calling it the good book and a moral code and handing it to children and then picking and choosing and saying these first ten commandments are the divine law, but the 603 that come after it we can ignore. 613. Yeah, the 603 yeah. that come after the 10. Oh, ah, I see what you're saying. I did the math ahead of time. <laughs> That's good, good work, job. Matt. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, um, just be tolerant of other people's beliefs. I mean, we live in America, and this is a free, freedom of religion nation. We're not like some of these uh, Middle sure. East countries, so don't let it upset you and let people read what they want and believe what they want. Well, well the thing is, is this isn't just a matter uh, of being upset. I'm happy. I mean, you're <laughs> entitled to believe whatever you want, and I'll support your right to believe whatever you want. The problem comes, though, when people act, uh, you know, you don't live in a vacuum, and you take actions that affect other people. And there is a contingent uh, within the population that identifies as Christian, who knows whether or not they true are, uh, truly are, that are out to marginalize the rights of others. And they think they are of the opinion that this is and should be a Christian nation and the Constitution be damned. Do you, we, think, we, do you think I believe that, Matt? Well, no, I, I don't necessarily know that you believe that, but I, I'm pretty sure that you vote along those lines, if I had to guess, that you're going to vote for somebody. You would be more likely to vote for somebody who would, for example, outlaw abortion than somebody who would want, wanted to continue with abortion being legal, wouldn't you? Absolutely. That's, right. that's my criteria. I don't care about the fiscal policies of anyone. If they believe in the murdering of children in the womb, I'll not vote for them. Sure. So you are part of the problem that is infringing on people's <laughs> rights by your I'm, voting. But I'd be a problem because I want to live kids to live in the womb. Because well, you don't get to dictate reproductive rights or any other rights for anybody else. I, I want to give you, you an example. Minute, that, that's, but that's, you take it back. If, if you vote for people that are, that are pro-abortion, you're doing exactly the same thing. I, I'm voting for people that are for reproductive rights. I'm for freedom. I'm for what this country was founded about. I am not trying to rip people's freedoms away based on my own personal views of what's right and wrong. Yes, you are. No, you're I'm doing not. What you're doing what you're accusing me of doing. You are dictating what a woman can do and can't do with her womb. No, I'm not dictating. I'm saying that she has the option. You are limiting an option. How is that? If this is like... Um, uh, this, is, this is like whether or not blacks and whites can marry. I'm saying they should be free to marry if they want to. It doesn't affect anybody else. Okay, and well, you're, you you're on the right position of America. That's cool. And you've got to give me the right to vote the way I want to vote. I, 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 vote I right give you the right. You I vote. fully give you the right. I, I, I've never denied that. What I'm saying is that by doing so, you are part of the problem that we're objecting to. Oh, so it's you that's objecting to the problem we're making by saying don't kill the children in the womb. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Let, let me give you an example of how... Um, like faulty beliefs could have some consequences. Uh, did you know that the world is going to end on May 21st? No, but it keeps changing. It's like the theory of evolution. Yeah. Right. So some people really, really believe that. And uh, just yesterday we were talking about a story in which a woman slit her kid's throat because she had the sincere belief that the tribulation was about to come. Now, you and I, <laughs> I think, agree that it's kind of ridiculous to try to pin this date down. But I think we would also agree um, that there are dangerous side effects of believing in something irrational. There's a lot of nutcases out there, and sadly, yeah. a lot of nutcases gravitate to the warmth and friendliness they find at a local church. Yeah, I, I mean, that is a shame. Yeah. And the media jump on something like that because it makes good news. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. When I first heard this, this announcement, I was like, well, this is the umpteenth you know, world is ending uh, in the past 10 years or so, um, and I didn't care about it at all, but evidently these people have some money behind them and put up billboards and managed to get some press, and it, then it's, of course, you know, had this dramatic result. And I don't, I don't remotely blame you on it. I don't blame, I don't blame all, of, all Christians, all anybody in any particular Certainly category for, for everything else that goes on. Um, and when I, when I talked a moment ago about you being part of the problem, I, wasn't, I was specifically referring to... Um, the issue of rights and uh, legislating in order to infringe upon people's rights. Right. Now, I understand that we have a very different view. and I, I, I probably could have gone with something easier. I picked abortion because it was obvious. I mean, I, I, 
I couldn't have imagined for a second that you would have any other view other right. than being opposed to abortion. Um, although I, I really, uh, having you know searched the Bible, uh, can't find any biblical support for that. Um, you, most Christians tend to cite Jeremiah 1.5, um, but if you read that carefully, it has nothing at all to do with the individual in the womb being an actual person. And Jewish law doesn't consider it that way. So it, it's kind of a... Well, a I don't go to Jeremiah. I go to where it says uh, when a woman is with child, it always uses that phrase. Yeah. So that's what, what my criteria so, is. So you're relying on the, the English from the 1611... Oh, no, no, not at all. I, if I wasn't a Christian... Uh, I don't think I'd want to kill a child in a womb, n no matter what. Well, I'm just saying that you, you're making your biblical appeal is that they use the phrase with child, and that's a particular, you know, not only English definition, but it represents the thinking of the time. Um, if this goes back to kind of wanting to make appeals to dark age ideas just because they're, they're consistent and when something, with, with what you already believe. Hey, I only believe back about, you know, a few thousand years when it comes to the scriptures. You go billions of years. So if anyone's got bigger faith, you have. No, because we have evidence for <laughs> th the fact that it's four and a half billion years old. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have gone back to that issue. I mean, <laughs> it's dead. Well, it, it was kind of a theme at the Yeah, first. no, it's, it's, you go back to whatever issue you want. It's, it's absolutely fine. You know, what I'd like to go to is the sure. fact that... Um, Atheists are always trying to get me to say how old I think the Earth is, and I really, I really don't care. And I'll just give a silly little analogy as to why I don't care how old the Earth is, and it might make more sense. I, this is this is my worldview. I see you and I, Matt and Russell and everybody else in this great big plane that's going to crash. We've all been given a parachute. We're told to put it on. Mm -hmm. And I say, Matt, please put on your parachute. And you say, how old do you think this plane is? No. What well, I, let you me know, the analogy, actually, right? Ray. Let me finish the analogy. Okay, and go I ahead. And I say, Matt, please, I don't care how old this plane is. Put the parachute yeah. on, then we'll talk. And you say, no, I don't believe in parachutes. I don't believe That's we have to not what jump. I say. That's not what I say. This is, this is why this analogy is so horrible. <laughs> well, I said it was pathetic when I started. Well, well why, what I say is, how do you know the plane's going down? What yeah. makes you think Well, you're going to die, aren't you? Well, actually, I'm Ray... I'm asking, uh, how do you know the plane's going down? Because I mean, you're going to uh, die. That's uh, what I'm saying. You're going to have to jump. Yeah, no, but no. a few minutes ago, I checked the altimeter and the attitude indicator and the rest of the scientific instruments on the plane, and they all showed me that the plane is actually holding steady and not crashing at okay, all. Okay, I shouldn't the only the going to, okay, The only the person who's coming to me telling me that the plane is going to crash is you. you you're, and, and by the okay, way... Let's forget the plane <laughs> crashing. I'm sorry I mentioned it was going to crash. Sure. You're going to have to jump. You're going to pass through the door of death. It's going to happen. Could be tonight, could be tomorrow, could be next week. I'm saying... Put on a parachute. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, uh, the age of the plane doesn't matter. I want to see you guys saved. I, I'd hate you to go to hell. My heart, my heart breaks at the thought of guys like you ending up being justly damned because of your sins. Uh, it breaks my heart that that would happen to any human being. I agree that I'm going to die. You're asserting something additional about death yes. that you can't dememonstrate. Yes, and I what can. You're, and what you're doing is akin to coming to me and telling me my house is on fire, as you used in the firefighter episode of, of Way the Master, um, which, by the way, I don't know if you've seen the minute-by-minute minute deconstruction I did of that one and the atheism one, but I'll point you to them if you'd like. Thank but, you. But you're coming to me and saying your house is on fire, and I look around, and I don't, see any, I don't smell any smoke, I don't see any fire, I go around, I look at the house, and I say, I don't see this. Well, if, if, there's, there's a standard by which we determine whether or not you're just a crazy guy knocking on my door to tell me my house is burning down. <laughs> What's the standard? The, the standard is I go around and look, and I don't see any fire. And I ask somebody else, have you seen any, any indications of fire? And no, they haven't as well, because reality is confirmed by mutual agreement sometimes as a way of gathering more evidence towards the truth. You know, there's a, there's a smoke detector uh, that you've got built in. It's called the conscience. And if you take the batteries out and don't let your conscience speak to you, ah. you'll think everything is fine. If you think there's nothing wrong with lust or greed or hatred or selfishness or, or uh, ingratitude to God, then you'll think you're sweet. But if, you, if you've got a tender conscience, I'm, I'm then, glad. then you'll see you're in trouble. I'm glad would, that scientific advances have given us smoke dete detectors, and it's interesting that none of these smoke detectors have indicated any sign of a soul so far. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me ask this. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I interviewed a biologist at uh, UCLA about two months ago, a, a, an evolutionary okay. biolog biologist, mm -hmm. and he changed his mind about the existence of the soul when I told him one thing. Would okay. you like to hear what the one thing is? I would is? love to hear sure. that. Okay, he absolutely did a big turnabout, and we've got it on camera, and I, I, God bless the guy for it. 
I just said, did you know that the word soul and the word life are synonymous in the Bible? Okay. He said, what? I said, yes. It is, they are interchangeable. When the Bible speaks of the soul, it's speaking of the life. He said, well, if that's, everybody's got a life, then everybody's got a soul. Sure. And okay. so that's you just, when you realize you got, that. You've got two atheists who will agree to your little semantic trick. It's not a semantic trick. <laughs> it's, it's different. <laughs> Saying that two words mean the same thing in the Bible is not the same thing as that we have some immaterial presence that continues on after we're dead. Do you have it's a soul? entirely, the soul it's entirely dishonest of you to even do that. Do you have a life, Matt? I have a life. And it's what motivates your body. It's what looks out of your eyes and speaks through your mouth and makes your brain work. It's your life. No. That's your soul. Those things are all part of my life. You can call it a soul all you want, but if you then say that this soul continues on after I'm dead, you've now made a claim. I didn't say that. Do, do you not think so? Yeah, God okay. said it. It's sure. eternal. Uh, you say that God said it. I don't, I'm not aware that any God has ever said anything, but you say this. Um, let me, we are almost out of time, and there's one thing I want to hit, uh, just to see if maybe we can agree on this. Bananas? All right. No, not no. bananas. <laughs> there, there, there are bananas on the, on the set, but it wasn't my doing. We didn't um, put them there. <laughs> let, me, let me get to this. In, in the book, um, you can lead an atheist, atheist to evidence, but you can't make him think. In the conclusion, you uh, start with your parachute thing, but then you say, now think of the four major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. And you begin to go through and assess them to determine which one someone should choose. You're familiar? Yes, with? yes, okay. I wrote that. Okay, uh, I won't hammer on the fact that you, you, know, you, you only picked four options because that's all we need re really right now anyway. But you assess all four of them with the preconception that Christianity is true. You fault Buddhism for not solving a problem that's intrinsic within Christianity. You fault Hinduism for, for something, not solving a problem. That you, you say, you know, the Bible says this, and Hinduism doesn't do anything about this, and Buddhism doesn't do anything about this. Isn't that incredibly dishonest because a, a Buddhist could look at Christianity and say it doesn't solve the problems of, that are intrinsic within Buddhism, and a Hindu could look at Christianity and say it doesn't solve the problems that are intrinsic within Hindu, uh, Hinduism. Do you think it's unfair to lay this on me when I've got one minute to answer how long we got? Well, I, I thought it was a really sure. easy answer. I thought you were just going to agree that, yeah. No, it's not dishonest. If you look at it and understand that the Ten Commandments make all the difference, and that's what shows all sure. those religions are works righteousness religions. You cannot earn everlasting life. It's, it can only come as a free gift of God. I, I, really wish, I really wish that we could demonstrate exactly why this is dishonest, but I think you just did by making an appeal back to the Bible. Um, you, you've got this presupposition, which is what I, I pointed out at the beginning, and you're judging it based on that presupposition. Well, we all do that. Well, no, we actually all don't. No. Ray, uh, uh, give, give a plug we, for we have, yeah, something, a yes. website, a book. We, we, we literally love gotta, having you on. We have to put the credits on. We'll be happy to have you again, but plug whatever you need for, for yeah, the Yeah, ATX, the ATX Experience is a great program. Good, good host. Uh, <laughs> good to talk to you guys. All right. Thanks a lot, Ray. Thank I you, Ray. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm not so sure God will bless us, but there's the crew. Uh, Frank Shelley, Steve, John, Don, and David, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in uh, to this special episode and, and tolerating all the, the rigmarole. Maybe we'll have Ray back on, who knows. Maybe we'll get Ray together in person someday. Um, maybe we'll have somebody actually admit that they have a preconception at the beginning uh, to save time pointing it out. But I don't know. I had fun, and I hope everybody else did too. Uh, we'll see you next week. Are you on next week? No, two weeks. Two weeks. Next week, r and Ra. Aaron's coming down for the lecture. That's April 3rd uh, at the Austin History Center. And then he'll be right here on this show. So it's a whole month-long guest shot. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye-bye. It's not unfair to begin with the Bible because you have to begin with...